classmate, Eve, my husband, the coach, because I felt like they needed one voice, not two. It's really difficult to have a parent as a coach at home because I grew up with one. My dad was my coach. Okay. And it was it was that constant pressure you feel. And I know how that feels like. Um, and they did not definitely did not need two <laughs> coaches at home. So but then when I took them on the road, my and my big vision for them was one, believe it or not, to really work on the coaches love working with them. And that why that was interesting, that's that's really important because as a youngster and in with through our lives, we depend a lot of uh, we need an encouragement and support from the coach. Right. right. So I would teach them, you know, how to get the, the coach's attention by working hard, by paying attention, by asking questions, just because. You know, from the coach's standpoint, you want an athlete, you want an athlete who is giving you the attention, who works hard, as you know very well. Yes. And um, and I taught them that right when, like, we're talking about kindergarten, you know, when they go to school, like, pay attention to what the, the teachers are saying. Um, and it, was, it became a little bit of an issue because Justin, my son, he didn't want to nap. He was being so he was like, you know, they had to bribe him to nap. But anyway, so that was the very first frame that I had wanted for them was that do things that your the coach or the teacher will gravitate helping you. Right. And the second thing that I was really um, wanting was uh, for tennis be a big part of their life I didn't I didn't know I mean nobody can tell where anyone can go especially when they're that young but tennis has so much benefits um, I'm not even talking about the pro levels I'm talking about the tennis for a it's a life lesson where right. you learn through the phases um, and that could take you that they could implement in different um, things the different fields that they choose to but even if they um, you know like for, for me, after I retired, I was still involved with tennis and, and the connections you make through tennis, the, there's so many doors that open up the way they are now, right? They're in college because of tennis. Of course. Um, yeah. So that was the second thing. And the third, the third framework, I worked really hard on being strong, be resilient, um, because you know, whether you are five years old, six years old, 20, 50, whatever, you're going to have challenges every day. Even a five-year-old has a challenge. It's different on a different level. I wanted them to be able to have that resiliency and the foundation of strength so they can keep coming back and, and face whatever is challenging them. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think that third one really hits home. And I think some of our, our previous speakers have I've kind of maybe mentioned it in, in, you know, maybe with different words, but that same idea of, of being able to kind of rise to the challenge, overcome our challenges and, and how tennis presents us with those opportunities. So that's really great. Um, okay, we read and kind of experience a lot of as coaches these days um, in terms of the parents uh, and the desire they have for their children to succeed, you know, specifically in tennis. Um, what is a major attribute you feel that is important in successful parent-child relationships uh, when it maybe comes to the development of their child? I, I don't know if the question is, is clear or... Yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, the biggest thing that parents can help is to uh, transition into different phases with the child. Because, right. you know, we have a tendency when our kids are younger, uh, you know, before seven years old, because they're completely dependent on us. We tell them what to do, what to eat, what to do, what to sleep. And then when they get into that middle section between seven and 14, they want a little independency. And, you know, we can't let go. We're like, OK, you got to go, you know, go, go, go. But we have to, you know, while we want our we watch our kids to develop in the tennis, us parents need to transition with them and knowing how much space to give them because I'm, I'm a huge um, advocate in giving ownership. We have to give at some point, we have to give ownership to our child so they can you know, take off with it. Um, that to me through my work, it's a one thing I see, which is very difficult because um, you're talking about culture now, yes. right? 
I, I grew up in Hong Kong. You know, I lived in Hong Kong in, in the East, East Eastern mentality for 17 years. And then I went to college and you know, I spent a lot of time in the Western world. And every time I remember, every time I went back home, I would go bang head you know, with my parents, because they're coming, you just don't talk back to, you know, right or wrong, you don't talk back. Um, right. And then, of course, I learned the freedom of speech. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, so culturally, um, you know, we have a lot of Eastern par uh, Eastern European parents who come from a very, um, they, they have, uh, you know, the drive, they have incredible drive, which is fantastic. And if we can transfer that, we could, but we cannot force it upon the child. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess kind of what these, what the parents have, have grown up and dealt with is maybe a lot different than what their children are dealing with right now. So, okay. That's really interesting. How was your experience then when you transitioned more to the Western world and, and you came over here and went to college? Did you feel prepared for that or... How did that transition go for you? It, uh, first and foremost, um, let me, I'll circle back to your question. Uh, if I forget, just remind me. Okay. <laughs> um, when I started uh, tennis, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be with, the, when I started playing tournaments, I wanted to be the, with the best of the world. Okay. It wasn't with time, and I'm coming back to your question, right? And then it was not until I was 17, right before I went to college, that I'm like, oh, you know what? Because people kept telling me I have this incredible talent work ethic that could be number one in the world. So right, the, the seed was planted in my head that I was going to be in, on the pro tour one day. Right. And it didn't matter when. So when I chose to go to college, which was a very difficult, it wasn't difficult for me, but it was it was not welcomed by Boletari, who was my coach at the time, because um, at 17, I was um, a finalist at Wimbledon, junior Wimbledon. I played five events at Wimbledon that last year. Um, I was finalist there and then I was number seven in the IT of junior and I was 65 right. on the WTA. Wow. So, so usually people just turn pro. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Wow. But, but what prompted me to go to college? Because um, now my parents was either way, they were fine. You know, they didn't right. force me to go pro. They didn't force me to go to college. It was whatever I wanted to do with a little hint from my mom, um, you know, because my parents, they were from Cambodia. They never finished. Uh, they didn't graduate high school. They wanted the academic look part. So I was like, Oh, okay. So I took it for granted that I will ever, will forever be a pro. So I went to college um, and it was uh, not difficult. It was difficult in terms of the training in college was different. Um, you know, I was brought up with the pro training and then went to college. It was um, uh, very different. And um, hence, uh, you know, the rules were also different at the time. And then I lost my, my WTA ranking. Okay, okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, that yeah. kind of kind of makes the full circle there. And I guess when you you talked about the training is a lot different in college. I mean, I guess they, they make a lot more of emphasis on the team rather than the individual in college. Did you find that that's where the training was different or maybe it was just not individualized to you? Um, yeah. It was a little bit of both. It was the training itself was completely different. You know, I was definitely not brought up as a team player, yeah. even though I played Fed Cup, but Fed Cup is what the team events is once a year. But right. in college tennis is like every, every day. Yes. So it, that was the biggest adjustments was being, you know, in a team mindset. Yeah. Um, the second was, uh, was second difficult was not every player on the team was gravitating you know they were they were not looking to go on the tour after tennis there was no life after tennis for them so it was a very nonchalant you know approach to practice um but i was kind of lucky because um there was another girl with me who ended on the tour with me so we were you know encouraged we were pushing each other because sometimes i would play one and then she'll two and then we flip flop so of course us two being competitive we want to play one all the time. So right. in that res in that respect, we were pushing each other. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that was a big benefit then that, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, some healthy competition there. Competition is good when you know how to drive it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, 
Okay, uh, another kind of question. We go a little bit of a different route now, and, and maybe we tackle a little bit the coaching side. So obviously you played on the, the highest level of, of the you know WTA tour and achieved a great ranking, had great results. And then, you know, you retire and, and kind of eventually go the coaching route. And of course, we see this from some top players that they get involved in coaching. And quite often, they maybe get involved in coaching on maybe um, more of a side of, of dealing with players who are already developed. But, you know, you got involved on a on a developmental level too. So what were some of the, the challenges you faced when, you know, going from player to, to becoming a coach? Um, the biggest challenge was um, to understand I didn't know it all. <laughs> you know, when you, when you come from, from the tour, especially, you know, when you, I had a, a successful junior career and then on, on, and at a young age and had that success on the tour. And, you know, you just think like, well, I know everything about it, you know, about right. tennis. So when I um, went into coaching, I remember this specifically like, okay, you know, I'm coaching now. Shouldn't like everybody be knocking on my door? Okay. <laughs> and then, and then there wasn't any, I was like, wait a minute. Let me let me think about this. So um, I had to really put away, I had to learn. I had to learn um, to put my hat aside and I had to learn how to simplify things because it'll be like, if you will, a professor, let's say in Harvard, right? And, yeah. you know, and then he's coming to teach the young, um, secondary school or even primary yeah. school. You can't talk the same <laughs> language because it's a completely different language. I had to go into, you know, making a forehand, for example, well, what is, how do you, turn a, a an offense into a defense and neutralize instead of like well if you get caught this way you know you just go down the line slap it down the line get it stuff back you know crisscross whatever so i had to really learn how to really simplify every step of the way yeah i think communication is is really a a, a, a big part of it there you know when when you're when you're playing and then all of a sudden you know now you're coaching and you have to try to kind of get that point across to whoever's in front of you and and different people take information different ways and understand it different ways so yeah that's you know it, it's interesting you mentioned that because of course like a lot of the um retired players you know after you're done um with the tour you go into the high performance coaching of course I, I i you know i was no different except that because eve was you know still working with with the with the pro players Jeannie Bouchard and them guys you right. know I then went into the fitness part of of, um, of the program and then it was interestingly interestingly enough I did not feel fulfilled okay I did not feel fulfilled when when we or when I transitioned into the high performance performance coaching with the transitional players because I felt like no you know they already like the cup is already half full so or three quarter full and then their window of improvement was very little i wanted something that i can start from scratch so i actually removed myself from that scene and um started an academy or, or a program of my own where i work with beginners and um my very first and i i talked so much about her because she definitely she was a she was a project and i'm so proud of her and i i see her um now and then she started with me when she was nine and uh, she's canadian her we were living in south carolina and she's canadian and the of course the parents knew me and they knew i retired and the, the dad approached me my daughter loves playing tennis so we have talked about it um so I was like, okay, great. Where, where does she train? She hasn't trained yet. So I'm like, wait a minute. She loves tennis, but she hasn't started. No, she wants to start with you. And I was like, <laughs> okay, so that's fine. So I, I found this one court, um, you know, somewhere that they were renting it to me. And I put this racket on her. The colored ball didn't come into play yet. So okay. it was just the, the, the regular racket. And she missed. So I was tossing ball from her across and then she missed. So I eventually went to her side of the court and she still couldn't connect. 
So I said, okay, let's put our, so I did not think, I have to really think because I've got an hour with this child who has no coordination. Yeah. Obviously. So I'm like, okay, put your right. So we started throwing balls to each other and she couldn't catch. <laughs> she could not catch. And I was, I now, by now I'm sweating because I'm an inexperienced coach. So I got so close to her and literally I would just like, okay, do it really slowly where she can actually have success with the palm of her hand, like literally face to face. So, so fast forward, we work on catching and then her hitting and so forth. Uh, two years later, she was able to play. And then a year when she got to 12 years old, almost not quite turning 12, she qualified for the nationals. Okay. So that to me was the beginning of my brain ticking like, that's where I want to go. I want to go and work with kids who completely don't know how to play tennis. And then I, we started this program for kids when my kids came along. Uh, the Kids Zone Fitness is, was all about coordination. I did not want to start tennis right off the bat. Okay, and this was your successful program out of Hilton Head Island? Yes, and you know, there's a lot of talk about athleticism in kids, right? Yes, actually our speaker last week, which was Andre LaBelle, I mean, he spoke a lot about the physical development and how important that, that area is in the kids. Absolutely, you know, I, um, that was after working with this player that gave me the, and then my kids we were born, it was things just fell in, you know, one after another, because um, I was thinking like, we had a nanny for them while I was working, and I was like, three years, I'm like, oh, you know, in one year time, they're going to be at school, and I won't be seeing them, but I wanted to be an involved parent, I want to be with the kids, right? Right. And then I, and then when Isabel was four years old and I was going to different sports and they didn't take anybody younger than five, right? Soccer, the only sport I could find was gymnastics that I could put her in. Even soccer, I'm, I could have lied her age. <laughs> I didn't lie about her age. So that gave me the idea, okay, why don't I start a program with coordination? So I went online and, and took did some research and found this doctor from New Zealand at the time. And she came up with two huge manuals teaching um, kids with coordination. So I bought all her books, resources, and I studied it. And then I came away and put a 10 weeks program with coordination. I took it to the Montessori school and I talked oh, to my wow. friends and I'm like, I could do this. And so, so I did this flyer on my own, started with four kids and it was all purely coordination, upper body, lower body. And then um, it became a, a program in itself. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've heard about your program out there and how successful it is just through talking with Eve, how well you guys did back in Hilton Head. So that's really interesting. And, you know, and what was interesting about that program, though, because that program was not to develop tennis players. Right. It was to, to, you know, to build the coordination, footwork at a very young age. But we did it on tennis court. <laughs> and then, you know, with a vision of like visually so they can transition into tennis should they choose to. Right. you know, the, the, the participants in that program. And um, of course, at that age, they all played basketball and soccer. And it was reported back to us that the kids that came to our program were more successful than kids just went straight into that sport. Into their sport, right. Yeah. yeah so just developing their, their athletic awareness, their coordination, their body awareness, and and this ended up making better athletes in whatever sport they went into. So yeah, and then the you know the lately um, as a couple of weekends ago, I did the commentating at the uh, Billie Jean King Cup for um, right. you know with Canada play Serbia, and they were saying how you know with Layla, her dad was a, in soccer, so she was brought up with with soccer. Um, you know, so you're seeing different, you're seeing this generation of tennis players adapting or played other sports. <laughs> Uh, before they picked up tennis, even Sinner, right? Um, okay. Yeah, Sinner was really highly involved with um, skiing until he okay. was 12, and then he transitioned to just tennis. Right, yeah, I think we have a, a similar story with Nadell too, who was mm -hmm. kind of such a high-level soccer player, he was kind of choosing between tennis and soccer, he could have gone either route, so... 
yeah, I think there's a lot of stories with uh, with different sports and and how it's kind of what you alluded to. It's it's just about developing the athlete at this young age and then you know letting yeah. them find the sport that kind of interests them after that. And, and it's a little worrisome to me when um, when I ask the kids, so you know, how long have you been playing tennis? Oh, since four. And did right. you play other sports? No, just four. So, you know, this dedication to narrowing to just one sport, or just tennis, um, maybe they have the upper hand, you know, who is so cute to see a five-year-old, a six-year-old, you know, hitting tennis. You know, I see this on um, Instagram all the time, right? The posting, how these get. Yes. And I'm so worried. I, I mean, how many times have we seen these posts? right? From Rick Macy's Academy, from Saviano, you know, it's amazing. And then three years, it's like, where did the kid go? Is yeah, it right. You, you never see another video about that child ever again. Right. The, the, the pressure, the pressure yeah. um, on these kids are tremendous. And I, I really encourage parents, you know what, and kids go do other sports, go, go, you know, until at such time, because at such time where you're like, okay, you know, stock, everything will add also on the mental development. It, it, it stretches, it opens up the, the window to, to the thinking part. Right. Okay. Let's jump into, um, let's jump into a, a question that kind of um, relates to you because you're, you're not just a parent and you're not just a coach. You're, you know, in, when, when it comes to your kids, you're the parent coach and, and sometimes, you know, there's other parents that kind of maybe want to want to take on this role or feel like they might be the best one to to help their kids or advise their kids. So, you know, what makes you such a, a successful parent coach as you are? And, you know, what is some advice or, or do you kind of recommend this route to the parents out there? Um, <laughs> If you, uh, I, I think I'm different because my kids know my background. Because here, for right. a non for a non tennis parent to try to give um, tips and suggestions, you know, to their child after let's yes. say that the matches, the first thing the kid's gonna think is like, well, you don't have you don't know anything about tennis. Now my kids can't say that about me. Right. <laughs> You know, um, the best thing advice I would say for parents is like to give them space and to to be a parent because it's really be empathetic, empathy to the feelings, because when the kid come off the court, when they have a bad day, they don't want to be scolded. They don't want to be reminded what they, I do this with our kids. You know, I, I don't need to bite my tongue. I, and my kids will tell you, I don't get nervous watching them because I am a true believer in sending good vibes. The, the closer relationship with your child, the more they're going to feel you, right? So when I'm watching on the, on the side of the court, and I know that they're going to mirror they're going to mirror my emotions. They're going to, if I, if I'm fearful, even inside, even if I don't think it, they're going to sense me that frequency. I know it's a little, you know, out there, but I know even in my playing days, you know, I have a, a close uh, working um, with the coach so I can feel that coach, how they're feeling, right? A little, you know, twitch or a little this and that the player feels it so for the parents I would say just be a parent of of hey you know what tough match let's let's just go get an ice cream let's go get this and that you know be a parent that's the best interestingly now when you do that the kids will open up because you're not forcing them you're not forcing them to talk to you yeah I think that's I think that's a really good point you know if, if the parents would would maybe leave an open end, you know, like, you know, how was tennis today? Or, you know, do you want to talk about it? A lot of the time you're, you're right. They just want to sit in the car and, and just, you know, take a break from it. They're not ready to talk. And, and like you said, quite often, if, if they're not maybe fearful or, or worried, then of course it's, it can be nice to be able to, to speak to your parents or, or have this, this feeling where you can open up to them. 
Yeah. And you know, the one thing that I was really strict, I didn't have many rules with my kids, but I feel like, you know, when I, I only have a few rules, but they are, uh, they are going, you know, to, I'm very strict with them uh, on just like two, three rules. One of them is, is a sportsmanship, right? Um, the way they behave on the, the attitude, the attitude on the court. Right. And um, I would wait. Um, sometimes I will wait depending on the situation. And um, Isabel, as you know, it's not, not the most contained, it, it, you know, of emotions out there. And um, neither Justin when they were younger because they want to do so well at such a young age. And I will, um, after a match, if I feel like, we'll talk about it if they had a, a bad day, bad attitude. And I said, and we'll talk about warnings. I'll give them several warnings. And it was getting to nowhere. So I said, listen, guys, you see these three fingers, right? They said, yeah, that's one warning. That's two warning, this one, and you're off the court. So um, Justin, I forgot what tournament. I mean, he was like 10 years old, right? And he's on the court, man, and start tossing racket, you know, hat is going down. So I went like this, like this, and like this. I'm like, out. And he's like, he looked at me. He's like, no. I'm like, out. So the, um, the referee came up to me, ma'am, you can't talk to your child. I'm like, you know what? Send me a warning. He's my child. I'm pulling him off the court now. So I went on the court and grabbed him off the court. You know, I just, so th that is where attitude starts from home. You know, it, to me is a, a, the younger they learn about the importance of having good attitude, the, the better it's going to serve them because that's the foundation to everything. Attitude is everything. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think sending that, that strong message is really important to follow through on your actions. You know, like I have a little saying that I, I use, it's be tough with your actions and soft with your words. And, and quite often I think parents sometimes get it backwards. They, they're tough with their words, but maybe they don't follow through with what they say and it becomes a bluff. And then the child starts to read this. And so I, I think, you know, what you demonstrated there was kind of a, a good, good example of it. Like, guys, these are the rules and this is how we're going to follow through. And if, you know, if you get three strikes, I'm sorry, you're off the court. Yeah. I mean, I've done it to even Isabel at nationals finals. We were in New Jersey. It was, she was in the finals. I mean, she was a, I think she was like six, one and something up. And then one point she missed and she completely lost it. You know? And I'm like, what's going on here so I I went up with this and then she didn't calm down and I just like you're done yeah. you know and um and then of course it were tears no 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 yeah. and we're having this conversation doing the match and I had to tell the parent I'm not coaching by the way I'm just you're know, doing this parent thing um yes I pulled my, is her out out of nationals finals too it is what sure. it is sometimes we got to learn the hard way you know mm -hmm. that's that's a tough reality yeah um, who is someone who had a major impact on your career and maybe you can explain why? Um, on my career, uh, I, I will have to, I don't have many coaches throughout my career, by the way. I have, um, you know, three, one with my dad and then Boletari and then uh, my husband, Eve. So yeah. three people. Uh, my dad of the three, I will have to say um, they all was um at different levels was yes. of importance because i don't i don't think one coach can carry you especially for the the tennis journey the that i had right. um so the i would say but i will say this the most important one was my dad because i was young when um as a child that's when you absorb a lot of things and that's when you put in a lot of uh, you know you can plant a lot of seeds in there and the 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 takeaway from my dad um, was always out, outsmarting. That was the thing. He was like, "Listen, I don't care what you do on the court, but you're not bigger than you know. You're smaller than them, meaning the girls. And even as a junior, I was pretty small." He said, "If you want to be successful, that means if you want to win, you need to outsmart them. You're going to use your head." And you're going to outrun them because smaller people can run fast. So he didn't let my size be, you know, a deficit. It was, he turned that into an asset. So he taught me to think. And even before I started playing tennis, really, we were um, at the time, 
Uh, we tennis TV wasn't around, so only the Grand Slams were televised. And, you know, we would watch matches together. And then he, I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but he did. He's like, he will teach me how to study the game. You right. know, like it was Yvonne Gulagong and Chris Everett, whatever. And he's like, look, ah, you, you know, that person, that player is sitting so far, the next shot, either slice low or drop shot, make the person run. So he was teaching me uh, geometry on the court before I even knew what that was on the court. Um, or, and then when I started playing, um, and then it would really ticked me off because he would say, oh, to beat you, to beat feet, you know, women's tennis is really easy, drop shot and lob. Oh my gosh, I was going insane. So of course, when we started playing sets, what did he do? Oh yeah, I ran like hell to get to that drop shot just to prove him wrong. And I knew what was coming too with the lob, I started, I started running. So yeah, right off the bat, I would say, you know, using to outsmart and outrun and those actually became, those were the two weapons that I went on a tour with. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think it's really interesting the, the part that you raised about watching a, a lot of tennis. And I read a lot of the um, kind of great players like Federer, for example, he really liked to watch a lot of tennis and try to learn from from you know maybe the opponents he was going to be up against or when he was younger to watch and and kind of learn about the game and I, I think this is maybe an important part that you know I, I hope this generation is is not missing that but I think it does take a real love for the game and and enjoyment to kind of watch an entire match unfold and see what's what's important okay now it's for all how does this change or now it's a tiebreaker how does this change and and to see like okay these guys are on the they're the best in the world, but even they're getting a little bit nervous in this moment. So, you know, maybe if I'm getting nervous in this moment, maybe that is a little bit normal. And, you know, to see like how they behave and, and I think for the parents too, to see sometimes how, you know, you get somebody on TV and he implodes and, you know, breaks a racket and, and God forbid, I mean, we never encourage this on anybody, but, you know, if, if it's tough for, you know, a, a, a grown person to do at times, then maybe, you know, our, our children, we have to try to educate them and, and sometimes um, understand that they're not going to be perfect either. So I think there's so many lessons you can get when you, when you watch the sport, you know, it's. But you know what, Mike, you did it, you, you nailed it. The, the key is to watch the whole match or the whole set and yeah. not the highlights because right. highlights are you know champagne shots what happens okay okay Federer maybe like every match but um but the point being when you are in the development right you you want to watch sometimes um the young players I feel like when they make a, an unforced error and they think it's the end of the world whereas yeah. you also see pros <laughs> making right. you know but it's really how do they how do they react? How do they bounce back? How do they carry themselves? Yes. Um, you yeah. know, th those to me are more valuable understanding, studying, you know, yeah. how the, how the, how the players um, react after they miss a shot, do they turn around, do they take a breather, do they look, look at the strings um, versus, uh, oh my gosh, did you see that down the line? That was, you know, the, the, the east west forehand, you know, going this way and that way. Um, I know it's difficult because, you know, we, we all, we all like to be entertained, but um, you know, we need to, we need to study the hard, hard stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really think that that watching the matches can can pose so much information uh, for the players, like you said, especially between the points and, you know, somebody's down three zero, but, you know, they're staying in there mentally and maybe they adapt a little bit, become a little bit more aggressive or a little bit more solid or whatever, you know, however they need to adapt, you know, tactically, but mentally they're they're really trying to stay engaged in the match and find that little thing that they need to to change so um mike you mentioned you know your one of your earlier questions was about you know parents um when i became a parent coach yes. um i i i want to circle back to that a little bit if that's okay for sure so before our kids even played tennis or rather it was my time and i during my time i don't i did not like um reading about myself nor watching my matches especially when i'm still in the event 
because okay. I didn't want to get it up here. However, I remembered playing um, Monica Salas, who was ranked one at the time in Montreal, and we went to three sets. And I, you know, was be um, so of course they kept replaying this match. What caught my eye that I held a high regard for when I became a, a parent coach? Um, Monica Salas' dad. They showed we went to the third set, and they went zoom in on the parents the dad was having the greatest time watching his daughter battling this nobody in the first set. And I just like looked you know, over and I'm like, oh my gosh, is that possible? Because, you know, you see parents, a lot of like, you know, Graf's dad being, you know, this or Jennifer Carpiati's dad being that, right? And then here on TV and he's so relaxed. Right here in my mind, I'm like, that's who I want to be when I'm watching my kids play because um, you have to enjoy when you can show that in the most intense moment and you can show that you're enjoying the competition, made the better player competitor wins, the kid will absorb that. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I think that's a really great story. I mean, um, hopefully they know who, who, hopefully they know their tennis history and know who Monica Sellis is. But like you said, I mean, it's, it's a former number one in the world, one of the greatest female tennis players ever. Um, unfortunately, her career got got a little bit cut short, but um, it was, uh, yeah, she was really special to watch. So that's a great story about her. Um, okay, one last question. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you are currently doing and why you've kind of gone down this pathway. I am working with um, the mental training for for athletes, uh, mostly in tennis, because that's, you know, my, my background is that my uh, this is something that I have not spoken very often, actually very few times is, um, you know, I was ranked 28 in the world. Uh, there was something um, along the way about, you know, that I actually secretly want to be number one, even though people coaches told me I could be number one. But, you know, it's, it's one thing somebody telling you, but it's quite another when you have it in you, I want to be there. Um, and, and I did well, you know, with, uh, with the, with the um, results. I could not with, I could not get climbed that 27 spot. And at the time I kind of knew I was looking for help. You know, I was fit, I was fast, um, had great work ethics. My tennis was good. The one element was up here. I wanted to know how the Steffi Graf of this world think out there, the Monica Salas who had unorthodox strokes, two, point, or two back end um, yeah, on both sides. There was something in here that they, when they were behind, they were just tough to beat. And when they were in front, there was no catching up to them. So I knew it was here and I, I was looking. At the time I had started looking for help. There wasn't much available. In my, in my time for a sports psychologist. So when I was finished, um, after I retired, this didn't happen. Only happened about four years ago when I came to Toronto and, you know, in the program, working with players, you know, every sing single um, reason I got from the players, from the coaches, why they lost was, oh, uh, fear, was fearful, confidence, you know, choking, all of, all of those things. So I thought, you know what, for me, my work, I, I'm passionate about tennis, no question about it, but I want to be fulfilled. I right. was not feeling fulfilled um, in the coach on court, co on court coaching role. There are a lot of great coaches in Canada. So I want to be like, okay, what can I do? So I thought the, the mind coach, somebody actually came and said, you're so good with the mental stuff. Why don't you do that? And I was like, yeah. So um, it was a bold move because um, there's really, if you look around, there's not one single tennis player. Sorry, I take it back. There was one, uh, Alan Fox, that was 20, 30 years ago. He was number one and he became a sports psychologist. Um, so, but female, you know, in this era, there isn't that many, especially Canadians. There's no female tennis player turned sports psychologist. Um, I try to um, get a degree, by the way. But um, I've only went to UCLA for two years, didn't get my undergraduate um, degree. And to further on with a PhD, you need to have at least an undergrad degree. 
So that's out the window. Um, right. So the best I could do was use my extensive professional experiences combined with the resources and stuff, you know, things I'm learning. I can't get a degree, but there's still many resources out there for me to study. Um, yeah, so I do workshops with mine, you know, coaching, training players. You know, uh, for me, the, the really important part is, as a tennis coach, you know, when, and when I work with my players and, you know, I've, I've talked to different sports psychologists in the past, but the part that really stands out to me is your background in being a former player. You've been out there, you've experienced it and your knowledge of tennis. Uh, I think quite often the sports psychologists lack that um, kind of specialty in the sport. And I think understanding the sport itself plays a big role in being able to help these individuals um, because this sport, it's, it is a little bit crazy how, how you know, the scoring is and, and what's expected of these individuals. And, and so, you know, yeah, there's a lot you can, a lot of information out there and a lot you can get from, from going to school, but the firsthand knowledge of, of going through that and experiencing it. And then, and like you said, having the different, different experiences with, with different parents on the tour too, like what were their parents like? You gave the story about Celis's dad and, and being able to connect to, to people through stories like this. I think this is really valuable information, so. Well, thank you. I, I do feel um, like, you know, even though I don't have a PhD, but my focus are, is on my experience. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke with the um, head department of the sports mental health of, on the WTA. And, and she said exactly what you said, because what I have is experiences because I could um, not only do, can I help with like, you know, tactically, of course, but how it feels when somebody's on the road for like six weeks, eight weeks, because I did that as well, you know, the psychologically, what it does to you. Um, and also uh, because of the, the combination of being a player and a parent coach. So my work is not only am I helping the players to go through the, uh, understand the pressure, what they have to deal with and tactically and, you know, in finding themselves in the midst of all that and restoring the confidence. I'm also helping the parents to, to connect the dot because at the end of the day, um, all parents want to give their kids the best opportunities and every parent wants to put their hand to help. So I said, okay, well, let me come in, be a joint event. Let's be a team, the player, the coach, and the parent, a triangle. And I'm just a glue helping all three together. Right. Do you have a website where people can get more information if they're interested? Yeah, it's uh, my first and last name. That's Patricia, H-Y dot com. Awesome. Awesome. Patricia, thank you so much for sharing with us today. It was really great. A lot of really great stories. And hopefully everybody was able to take something away from this. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Anytime, Mike. Great, great. Well, you take care, Patricia. Thank you. And good luck to the team. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.